checked the data with geeks, and uh, we looked at the data. This is a, um, a map produced by the San Francisco, um, San Francisco Public Health uh, Department. They evaluated 36 um, different um, indicators for resiliency of a neighborhood, like how likely they are to uh, given hazards, environmental environment around it, uh, things like uh, um, housing, economic uh, wealth, and health and demographic of the the of the neighborhoods, and uh, the and, and rank that those neighborhoods uh, on a scale of one to five. We used to live here on a four scale. We now live here on a two scale out of five, so much lower uh, possibility, much lower uh, resiliency uh, for, for the neighborhood itself. It's a more vulnerable place. And so the, 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 the comfort that we used to have in the other place was, went away and we needed to make a plan. My wife said, I have a plan, I have a plan. I know what I'm gonna do. We need to know our neighbor, neighborhood better. We need to improve the, um, the quality of the data, the information that we have and uh, because otherwise we're going to get screwed. We're going to be the few, the ones that we need help instead of being the ones helping others. Um, so we we'll sat around and we looked at the, the amount of information that is um, in, in, um, available already on, uh, on OpenStreetMap. We realized that the quality, the, well, the coverage is not as, um, as good as, was, as I expected. Uh, and I realized afterwards, after diving a little bit deeper, that indeed a lot of uh, um, Californian and United States, uh, well, I don't want to generalize, but definitely in California, a lot of um, data is not an open street map. It's kind of, it's not as popular as it is in, uh, as a tool in Europe or as I thought it would be. But, so, um, we looked at OpenStreetMap and we, uh, we, 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 we thought, okay, so most of the features are in there. We, we just have a, a quantity problem. Um, but we, uh, we also, um, we thought about, we started talking to other nerds. And, uh, um, and we, we realized that other groups, uh, they were doing the same thing. They were, they were looking around uh, and trying to build maps. And they were using all sorts of different tools. Uh, as you can imagine, Open, uh, OpenStreetMap was not one of those. They were working on uh, Google Maps and they were adding features uh, with points and dots. They were using companions with uh, like printing a map from any, any source or just buying a map from even the one from the, the, um, the tourist board. Um, and, um, and they were adding features manually on top but what happened is over time, these maps became, uh, were becoming obsolete, they were not maintained, and, and uh, the new uh, uh, people would move to another neighborhood and, and they, they would change. So all of the information was lost. Uh, so we, we pushed, we started talking to people and pushing for using OpenStreetMap as a standardized tool for data entry, at least for the data entry. We had a little bit of resistance because um, um, uh, given the OpenStreetMap works fantastic for data entry, it's got its own review system, its publication system is very fast, uh, but the, the applications that, like mobile applications or they're not super friendly for, especially if you, if you give it to someone who's not a computer uh, person or, or a mapper, they just volunteers and they need to add one piece of information. But, um, and we also noticed some things like features that were not uh, properly tagged like this is um, this is a, uh, a police and a combination of uh, uh, a call box uh, you may have seen them in other parts of uh, of the world too and and uh, they were and they're also in New York and there's an interesting story this one has didn't have a key uh, in OpenStreetMap and uh, I proposed one and and it was it would there was an interesting conversation on the tagging mailing list about this because some it, it's in most parts of the world, these are obsolete. These are not considered useful because you can call, uh, if there is a fire, you can give a very good, uh, you, can, you can use your phone to make a call. Um, in, um, in San Francisco though, these, these things have been reinforced and, uh, and they're used for redu redundancy. So they are actively maintained. In New York, they were thinking about getting rid of them until the uh, Hurricane Sandy hit. And they were very useful during Hurricane Sandy. So they're now maintaining those too, instead of getting rid of them. So uh, we had to fix 
well, we had to fix. We had to add that feature to OpenStreetMap. It was missing for our city. Um, and we're working on adding another piece of information that is missing on OpenStreetMap. There is an open proposal on the wiki. Uh, we can talk about this if, uh, uh, afterwards. These are buildings that are called um, uh, soft story, soft story buildings. These are buildings where usually the bottom floor is more flexible than the top ones, or at least there is one floor that is more flexible than the rest of the structure. And these are uh, li most likely to collapse. After 89, San Francisco did um, a census of the buildings uh, in, in the city, and there are 13,000 of them, 13,000. Uh, they're being fixed one after another, but there's still many of them that are not done, um, and the program should be done by 2020. Oh, one interesting thing. Notice something that I would, never, would have never thought about, even, if I'm an, um, even though I'm, a, I'm an architect by train, but bricks ex uh, shoot out once, uh, once there is an earthquake. So one thing that they teach you at NERT training is to be aware uh, when, when the ground starts moving, go away from anything that looks like a brick because it will be a projectile uh, projected outside. Get out of the way. Um, so we, we started working with uh, the NERT. You can see they, they carry these vests. Um, <laughs> and um, we ran a couple of mapathons with them trying to uh, testing and building a playbook, basically, that can be used and replicated in other parts of town and across the different communities to, to map and add the features that you need. So we use field paper. After some research, we uh, decided that paper is the best way to, to add information to OpenStreetMap. You don't need uh, to have someone trained explicitly for OpenStreetMap. You can, you can hand anybody a piece of paper with, uh, with a map, um, grayed out map in a background, and they can add keys on top, like this number here or another number there. And, um, and then uh, using this QR code, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, field papers, uh, gives you um, a URL here on the, uh, that you can scan, upload into OpenStreetMap and use that automatically as a background. Um, on, um, and, and then you can geolocate very easily the new information that you collected on the field with pen and paper. And, and um, th this, this is a picture from uh, December, so very, very recent. recent. And um, so after that, the data entry is the, let's say, we, we, we basically solved this problem. We're now working on the visualization layer, and we have a little bit of constraints, but the, the main, uh, the, the first prototype we, we built is with uh, QGIS, with pulling data, uh, you know, with, uh, with a couple plugins from, um, from uh, OpenStreetMap and then producing a map that looks, uh, shows the features that we want, like the fire alarm, the shop car repair, fuel stations, uh, buildings with uh, that vulnerability, see how many there are. <laughs> um, you know, hospital uh, construction zones, like these guys, there is a lot of them. There is one more here now. Um, and um, and we're, we're getting, we're getting we're, we're expanding. We're also, we had um, in September, uh, well, September 2017, but also uh, last year, we had um, heat waves in San Francisco, something really unheard of. Well, uh, you know, the heat wave in San Francisco is not the same heat wave that we have in Europe. I realize that 38 degrees Celsius is considered a heat wave in San Francisco. And in fact, actually, uh, three people died during that, during those uh, couple of days in, um, in September. But in any case, um, heat waves and change in climate in general um, are, are becoming an issue. And in fact, there is as much of an issue that the, the San Francisco Public Health um, Department also has done some work and some research to evaluate how uh, the, the impact of, um, of a heat wave on the community. And, and um, they built this map where they identify the places where there is more likelihood of having issues in, uh, in case the temperatures go a little higher. San Francisco buildings usually don't have uh, air conditioning. We just open the windows and wait for the fog to come in, and it's pretty reliable uh, all the time. 
But there are there have been cases, especially in 2017, um, less so last year, that things happened. So, but what happens is the the resiliency is not just earthquakes. That's um, what we realize. It's not just that you need to prepare for a quake. You need to prepare for other things that will not be predictable, are not predictable, and can create discomfort in in a community. And what me, what this means is that um, we we can map. We can use census. Um, census information to, um, to identify the neighborhoods, the, the areas where people are more likely to suffer from heat. And uh, on a map, we can also add information about um, the, ref, uh, ref, uh, what are they called, um, cooling centers. The cooling centers like uh, public swimming pools or public libraries where air conditioning is usually, is usually on. Um, community centers where there is also air conditioning and when people, the most vulnerable population can, can go and, and refresh. Or, you know, during the extreme cold weather that hit uh, the East Coast recently, um, it's the same, the same kind of principle. You, 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 if you have a map and you know the resources that you have, you can definitely prepare and, and be ready to respond in case of um, emergency of any kind hits. And... Um, and you can also more easily rally your uh, response team, your um, emergency response team to help out. So, um, so what's next? Definitely on, on the San Francisco area, um, we need more data. We need more data entered into, into, the, into OpenStreetMap uh, because we need, we, the coverage is not, is not that great. And some neighborhoods are better than others, but definitely we need more. Uh, but I consider this kind of a solved problem. We basically have now um, a playbook for, for Mapathon, running Mapathons. We can easily replicate and train trainers so that we can, we can have a, a consistent production of uh, good data and therefore good information for earthquake response specifically. Um, we're still working and we need a better way of um, running the maps, uh, uh, visualizing the maps. And this is a harder problem to solve. I still haven't cracked it. The QJS is fine, but you need someone trained in order to uh, really produce a map and print a nice booklet every three months or six months. You know, maps, the moment they're printed, they're old. So, um, but you, you still need to have something on paper because in emergency, you will, you know, you will lose internet access. That's the assumption. Uh, so um, we, we have a hard constraint here because we really don't want to run our custom server, so we would really like to have something lightweight that runs and, and pulls information live quickly from, uh, from um, OpenStreetMap, builds the map with the skin and, and uh, the, the way we want it to be presented and prints a booklet. Um, we're still working on that. Um, I'm, you know, if you, anybody is interested in this, we can talk about it and um, I'd be happy to have more volunteers joining. And then um, we want to be expanding this to other areas too. We would like to see other communities think about response, not just emergency response, but uh, emergency preparedness. When um, we, we started working, we started pre um, contributing to OpenStreetMap after the Nepal earthquake into 2015. 2015 and uh, we realized that there is a, we, we found out about the, open, the um, humanitarian OpenStreetMap uh, hot um, initiative, and we worked a lot with them using trying to collect, you know, find out which buildings um, have collapsed and which roads are still working and things like that. And those are th that's great after the quake. Uh, before before the quake, having uh, um, knowledge of your neighborhood and knowing which buildings are more likely to collapse, that they that will help you. If you survive, you know, if you're, if you're completely able, then you can go and check those buildings first. And sometimes arriving fast is, is crucial to, to save someone's life. And, and uh, um, at the same time, if you know, and it's very predictable that there is a new um, a heat wave or a cold snap uh, coming in, then you know which buildings you're going to have to go and check whether they need something, like they need shelter, they need, they need, uh, they need help. Um, so uh, this is also something that we're very more than help, happy, happy to, um, to go and talk to a meetup or 
start organizing other, help you organize other local, local groups the way we've been doing things in San Francisco. And with that, I think uh, these are my contact. This is my shameless plug for the sponsor. Um, this is me, and this is my wife. And Michael is, um, is helping us, is one of our volunteers. The slides are also on um, uh, fosdem.org on the website. The same place where you give feedback, you can download the slides. And thank you. Liquefaction? Yeah, or, or some of those zones that are um, Yeah, we, we're not, not really. We're not thinking about that because in San Francisco specifically, those are known. Those are disclosed by every time you buy something or you, or you even if you rent something, a building, you're, that information is disclosed. So I don't think it really fits into um, open street map. Yeah, not unlikely. Um, paper, paper is the one thing that will for sure work. And, and uh, devices, they will need to be charged. So in the 72 hours uh, website, they will tell you that yes, you need to carry a lot of batteries um, and you need to stuff batteries and, and solar panels and all of that into your uh, carry-on bag. Most likely you're gonna need the batteries to listen to the radio uh, to operate your ham radio or portable ham radio if you're a nurse emergency responder. Um, so, you know, in the budget of how much energy you need, you, you may want to have the paper and maybe the, the extra app too. But I would think of paper as a first thing. In any case, volunteers are welcome. I mean, if you... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. You were first? Um, no, that was purely by chance, and I can tell you the the rest of the stuff. Like the the first one, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, it's correct. No, the algorithm was much simpler. It was, um, and it was related to not having a credit score when we moved to the United States. <laughs> It's very general purpose. The, the way we're thinking about this is uh, really a playbook for learning about your place and be able to help in case of emergency, any kind of emergency. So for this first implementation, we thought about the, we, we followed the, the NERT training program for which resources you have to have available. Uh, but as I showed, I mean, on, on this other map for the, for the heat waves uh, protection thing, you, 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 don't, you don't need to know for, Supermarkets will have refrigeration and they will have water and most likely they will help you in case of emergency. Uh, in case, you know, it's too hot outside, they will probably donate to an organization if you set it up that way. Like NERT, uh, they can go to a tool shop and ask for, for tools to, to, you know, help save someone from, from under a building or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you have a different angle on, on yeah. what is useful and important. Right. And Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You you just have to think about the the features that you want to represent and then select those. Uh, do you cooperate with other uh, communities and other areas which are disaster sensitive? Which have the same needs and maybe also OSM enthusiasts? We we haven't started officially, but uh, we're more than open to do that. We noticed that there are other uh, resiliency efforts, uh, even at UN and other organizations they have, they have these efforts going on. So it's not an isolated thing. Yeah.
Uh, nope. Let's talk afterwards. I, I want to write it down. Well, that's it. That's exactly what I want. <laughs> awesome. And it, it pulls from OpenStreetMap, I'm guessing. Yep. Awesome. Uh, we can talk about it on Sunday. Yes. It turns out you're going to have a fight. Well, there's no innovation in that from <laughs> um, leave feedback, please. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.